evening, ladies and gentlemen, and good evening to, to our online audience. We're here this evening to debate a topic which has already been much in the news this week with the publication yesterday of a paper by the Centre for Policy Studies. But then it's a topic which is rarely far from the headlines and which regularly divides opinion, that of assisted suicide. The motion this evening is assisted suicide should be legalised. The terminally ill should have the legal right to be helped to end their lives. We have six speakers, three for and three against. For the motion are Emily Jackson, a professor of law, Debbie Purdy, who has MS and has successfully campaigned to have the law clarified on assisted suicide, Mary Warnock, the moral philosopher and former member of the House of Lords Select Committee on Euthanasia. And against, we have Alex Carlyle, QC, Lib Dem peer and joint chair of a think tank on living and dying well. We have Paddy Stone next to him, who's a senior lecturer in palliative medicine at St. George's University of London. And at the end there, Richard Harris, Lord Harris, former Bishop of Oxford, whose latest book deals with questions of life and death. You've already been asked for your view as you came in, and I'll be giving you the result of that entrance poll after we've heard the main speakers, our six main speakers. And then I'll open up the debate to the floor. And as the speakers sum up towards the end, I'll ask you to vote again by tearing your ticket in half and, and handing it in for or against, and then we'll give you uh, the, the full result and we'll see any swing that may have occurred at the very end. Each speaker has up to nine minutes to make his or her case. Um, I've got a stopwatch somewhere. Um, I'll get it out in a minute, but I'm going to introduce you to our first speaker to propose the motion. She's Emily Jackson, Professor of Law at the LSE. Her special interests are in reproductive and end-of-life issues, and she's currently writing the in-favour half of a book called Debating Euthanasia. So her arguments are no doubt well honed. Emily Jackson. Thank you, Sue, and thank you for the very kind invitation to talk to you this evening. I'm speaking here in favour of the legalisation of assisted suicide, but I think it's really important to clarify exactly what I'm for in this context. I am certainly not for immediate access to assisted suicide on demand. My argument is a much more modest one. I believe that we owe it to people who experience unrelievable and irreversible suffering, and importantly also to those who worry that this lies ahead of them, to do all that we can to alleviate their fear and distress. Now, this is not an argument in favour of death. On the contrary, I think an effective assisted dying law could extend and enhance the lives of people currently facing the prospect of a prolonged and distressing decline. Now, what do I mean by that? Currently in the UK, patients whose fear of dying is overwhelming can, if they can afford it and are well enough to travel, visit a Dignitas clinic in Zurich or if they're fit enough, they can kill themselves before they become incapacitated. Now, in both cases, this means they die sooner than they would if they had access to assisted dying in the UK. And it inevitably means that they don't have some of the most basic components of what we might call a good death, being at home um, with the people you love most around you. If you go to Dignitas, you're in a clinic in Zurich, very far from home, and often far from some of the people you most care about. If you kill yourself, you may feel the need to do so alone in order to avoid incriminating your family or friends. An effective assisted dying law could also enhance the lives of the dying because it's reassuring to a much wider section of society that would ever, in fact, access it. There was a recent study of patients requesting euthanasia in the Netherlands, and it found that the vast majority did not at that time want to die. What they wanted was an insurance policy against future suffering. Fewer than 9% of the people who initiate requests for euthanasia and assisted suicide in the Netherlands die as a result. What the evidence shows is the existence of legalised assisted dying provides reassurance to people. It in fact appears to enhance their ability to tolerate the present burdens of treatment. So it's the prospect of being able to maintain control and autonomy at the end of life, which is of value to many, many more people than would ever actually opt for an assisted death. It's also really important to note at the outset that there's a really critical difference between my position 
and that of the opponents of this motion, because I agree with them that a life which is full of suffering can nevertheless have tremendous meaning and value. They would clearly not seek an assisted death for themselves, and that's a decision which I would both respect and admire. But having seen people suffer at the end of their lives, I'm fairly sure, though nobody can ever be completely sure, that I would not want to continue living once life had permanently lost any meaning for me. Yet the opponents of this motion's view is that I must endure a dying process which fills me with horror. Now, in a liberal society where we accept that people's fundamental moral values differ, we should strive as far as possible to ensure that people like the opponents of this motion and those of us in favour can coexist without any of us forcing our values upon anyone else. So I wouldn't force assisted death upon them, but they would force me to endure a death which I would find intolerable. So the starting point really is that there is among a subset of patients suffering from conditions like cancer and motor neuron disease a strong and understandable desire for more control over the dying process that lies ahead of them. Now, it's often suggested that palliative care is a much better solution to the problems faced by these people than helping them to die. And it's undoubtedly true that palliative medicine specialists are now really very well equipped to manage pain. Inadequate pain management for most people ought to be a thing of the past. But the evidence suggests that what people fear most towards the end of life is seldom pain. The surveys from Oregon and the Netherlands consistently show that people's principal motivations for seeking assisted death relate to loss of autonomy, cited by 97% in Oregon in 2009, loss of dignity, cited by 92%, and loss of the ability to do the things that make life enjoyable, which was 86%. Inadequate pain control, or fear of it, was cited by only 10%. It's also important to be absolutely clear that not everyone experiences the loss of control that prompts some patients' requests for assisted dying as intolerably distressing. Some people who are profoundly incapacitated and dependent gain considerable meaning and value from their lives, and they deserve to be treated with the utmost respect. My point is that it's the patient, him or herself, who's the expert here. And the fact that extremely ill people have different views about what it means for their lives to go well or for what it means for their lives to meet a minimum threshold of tolerability is a reason to respect that diversity rather than to force those who would prefer an assisted death to instead have to endure the suffering they are desperate to avoid. It's true, I think, that a request for assisted dying should prompt us to investigate other ways in which a person's distress can be alleviated before proceeding to assist them in dying. But that is an argument for a robust filter on access to assisted dying. Not only a palliative care filter, which is what happens in Belgium, where a request, excuse me, a request for euthanasia prompts extensive investigation of what other sorts of palliative care might be able to address the patient's concerns, but also what you could call a social support filter. So if someone asks their doctor for help in dying, of course it's right to see what else could be done to relieve their distress. They may be suffering from treatable depression, their pain control may be inadequate, or they may be isolated and need more social support. My argument is that it's acceptable for assisted dying to be the last option on that palliative and social support menu. When we can't do any more to relieve someone's distress, we shouldn't abandon them to a dying process which they find unbearable. Now, the distinguished philosopher James Rachels asks us to imagine a choice between two deaths. If we opt for the first death, we die quietly and painlessly at the age of 80 after being given a lethal injection. The second death involves us dying a few days later, at the age of 80 plus a few days, but from an affliction which is so distressing and frightening that we spend those last few days howling like a dog with our family standing helplessly by. Now, I'm prepared to believe that some people's religious faith would lead them to prefer the second option. And that's obviously absolutely fine. But surely, the vast majority of us, basing our decision upon our own preferences, would opt for the first death. And if the first death is so obviously preferable, surely there's something wrong with the legal system which absolutely forbids the painless death and insists upon allowing only the terrifying one. Now, of course, palliative care and the hospice movement have made the process of dying less institutionalised and more comfortable for millions of people. 
Every patient should obviously have the right to high quality palliative and hospice care. But while many people's pain and distress can be effectively managed and alleviated, the core really of my argument is the claim that this is not universally the case. Now of course this is an empirical claim, but in my view the evidence to support it is overwhelming. We know that the desire for assisted dying exists upon, among people who have access to really good quality palliative care. In Oregon, 92% of those who ask for assisted suicide are enrolled in hospice care. Diane Pretty and now Debbie Purdy in the UK have felt so strongly about this issue that they've devoted years of their lives to fighting protracted battles in the courts. If it's true that palliative care cannot alleviate everyone's suffering, those who argue against legalisation of assisted dying are forcing people like Diane Pretty and Debbie Purdy to experience death they don't want because other people's values are more important than their own perception of their own suffering. I'm fairly sure that there will come a time in my own life when I don't want to suffer anymore and would prefer an assisted death, but I'm not allowed to have one. And that strikes me as a gross interference with my right to make the most important decisions about my life for myself. If I want an assisted death, I would be saying that my life has ceased to have value to me. That's an entirely different thing from saying that I no longer have any value as a human being. Many opponents of legalisation argue that to permit assisted death would be to devalue the sick, the elderly and the dying. But I think that's illogical. I really respect Debbie Purdy's view that there may come a time when she's had enough and wants to be helped to die. But I don't think that means when that time comes she will cease to be an extremely valuable human being. Opponents of assisted dying have the right to say, this is not for me, I want to live until the bitter end. And if I'm a doctor, I want no part in helping patients to die. They do not have the right to impose that preference on me. Emily Jackson, thank you very much indeed. Our first speaker against the motion is Alex Carlyle QC. He's a practicing barrister. He was a Lib Dem MP for 14 years and now sits in the House of Lords. Along the way, he was the first MP to campaign for the rights of transsexuals. Earlier this year, he became the joint chair of Living and Dying Well, a public policy think tank set up to look into the arguments surrounding exactly this debate. Alex Carlyle. Can uh, you all hear me upstairs as well at the back? Yes. Microphone system working up. Good. Well, first of all, can I say how grateful I am to Intelligence Squared and to the Evening Standard for giving us the opportunity of a debate in front of such a large and interested audience tonight. Um, I come to this debate as a secular person, as a parliamentarian, as a lawyer, and particularly as a person who's taken part in the process of making laws in both houses of parliament. I recognize that this is a subject that provokes great emotion, but it's one of those subjects on which we have to recognize that serious people with the greatest of courtesy can disagree seriously about what is such a, a serious subject. I don't claim to a monopoly of rectitude. We can never be certain of our rectitude on a subject like this. We can only believe in it, and there are people who believe in their rectitude strongly on both sides. But I would say to you at the outset that we should not look upon the phrase assisting suicide as a euphemism because it can be seen as a euphemism. There is a danger of that. If somebody assists suicide, the reality is that that person is helping to kill another human being. And in law, it's a form of homicide. And what we're doing here is talking about legalizing a form of homicide. Now, my starting point, I hope, is an entirely ethical one, that it is wrong to take or assist in taking another person's life unless it is permitted by law. Now, you know, we can often ask for laws that would make our lives different because we would like that law to be made. But that's not the standard. Law has to be judged by an objective standard. It has to be good law. It has to be certain law, that is to say, law that can be applied with certainty and can be clearly understood. And my starting point is the law is clear at the moment. It is well understood, 
the Director of Public Prosecution's guidelines as a result of Debbie Purdy's case are particularly clear, and in my judgment, they provide the right dynamic tension that enables one to judge cases where there has been assistance of suicide. And uh, the Director of Public Prosecutions, with the sensitivity which he's come to be recognized for, judges these cases carefully. Now, the starting point in law, actually, is this heavily tatty volume that I've been carrying with me for about the last 30 years. I used to cite it to judges at one time, and they used to look at me as though I was talking a foreign language. It's the European Convention on Human Rights, but these days it's something that's cited daily to judges in almost every part of the law. And Article 2 makes it absolutely clear, and this is an unqualified right, that nobody shall be deprived of his life intentionally, save in very clear circumstances. And uh, the clear circumstances are set out as uh, in defending oneself, I am summarizing now, defending oneself or other people in face of really serious danger, or in a war defined as such under the law of war. I don't know how many people have read Article 2 in this room, but it repays reading, for there are no exceptions. And indeed, Debbie Purdy's case created no exceptions. She won her case, and it was reflected faithfully in the guidelines made by the DPP. So I would argue that what we have is a law that is true to the European Convention, that protects weak and vulnerable people, that protects those who may have changed their mind about this issue uh, without the danger of dying without it being clear that they've changed their mind. And it protects those who are uh, feeling that they're a burden on their family and a burden on the resources of their families. Nobody has produced a certain way or even a, 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 an intelligently thought out way of judging what has been called autonomy. And indeed, I shudder slightly, if I may say so, with great respect to Professor Jack Jackson's excellent speech, at the way in which that word autonomy is used sometimes by lawyers as though it was an absolute right. Autonomy is not an absolute right. The law does allow a great deal of autonomy, but the law also takes away a great deal of autonomy. At the most crude level, the right to travel free upon the railways is taken away by the law that forces you to pay for your ticket. And it's a matter of judgment where one allows autonomy to run and where one limits autonomy in the public interest and the interest of good law. Further, useful and interesting though debates like this are, I'm afraid the reality that those in favor of this proposed change have to face is that there is only one place where this law can be changed, and that's in Parliament. And so far, Parliament, insofar as it has been asked to judge this law, has rejected it comprehensively. I'm puzzled by the approach that's been taken because nobody in the House of Commons has taken up this issue for, as a private bill near the top of the agenda so it could be fully debated and taken through all its processes in the House of Commons. The Joffe bill um, was defeated to the extent that the House of Lords didn't want to hear any more of it by nearly 150 votes to 100, and the Faulkner Amendment was defeated in the House of Lords by 194 to 141. And let me tell you the reasons why I think in huge debates and uh, very interesting debates, those proposals were rejected. First of all, it is assumed that doctors would be the judges. Now, there are two points about that. The first is that a lot of doctors don't want to be the judges of whether a person should have assisted suicide. And therefore, you have a self-selecting group of doctors, some of whom, of course, most of whom are extremely honorable people, but they select themselves because they are the ones who believe in the process. Secondly, one has to be realistic and say that doctors are no more guaranteed to be capital G good than any other group of people in society. They're no more good as a group than lawyers or plumbers 
or uh, 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 refuse collectors. They are a group of people with particular skills. And I do not know where this myth of the reliability of a self-selecting group of doctors comes from. It certainly hasn't been proved to be reliable. Um, the reality is that, first of all, a law permitting assisted suicide won't happen because it's contrary to Article 2 of the uh, European Convention on Human Rights. Whatever the Dutch and the Belgians are doing, apparently people in those countries have not fully challenged what is permitted there, but it would be challenged here. Secondly, it's completely contrary to our legal tradition in, and concepts. We simply do not accept that one member of the public should be involved in killing another member of the public, save in the circumstances I've set out. Thirdly, nobody has produced anything remotely acceptable as a way of achieving this. Lord Faulkner pr pr proposed his amendment for assisted suicide. He was a former Lord Chancellor. He had a panoply of legal experts at his disposal. He proposed that certificates should be obtained from coroners. When I read his amendment, I telephoned the coroners. They hadn't been asked. And they were absolutely furious that this had been proposed without their consent. And it's simply an example of floundering around to try and find a way of producing a system that would be reliable. Um, who are these self, this self-selecting cadre of death regulators, to quote Christina Odoni, but she's right in using that phrase, who would carry out this work? Further, and I look forward to hearing from Baroness Warnock, she said um, on, in September 2008, pensioners in mental decline are wasting people's lives because of the care they require and should be allowed to opt for euthanasia even if they are not in pain. Well, the premise behind that is deeply shocking, that pensioners in mental decline are wasting other people's lives. Anybody who's had a loved one, and I had a beloved godmother who had a very serious mental decline, knew that she wasn't herself, but she was enjoying every memory she was able to sum up, even in the random way in which they appeared. At the end of her speech, Professor Jackson said this should be the last option on the menu. I'm afraid I find that very unattractive language, particularly coming from so distinguished a lawyer. The, 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 the metaphor of a menu is not a good one here. We're talking about law, not menus. And in my judgment, and I would urge this upon you, there is no system of law which anyone has been able to devise which would ensure that the vulnerable, the sick, the disabled, and those who change their mind would be protected. Let's leave things just as they are. Lord Carlyle, thank you very much indeed. Um, our second speaker to the motion is Debbie Purdy. Debbie was diagnosed with MS in 1995 when she was 31. She wants to choose when she wants to die, preferably with the help of her husband. Her campaign prompted the DPP to publish new guidelines clarifying the circumstances in which an individual might not face prosecution for helping a loved one to die. And her campaign uh, for dying to be made legal in the UK, as per our motion, continues. Debbie Purdy. Thank you. I'm not going to go to the lectern because you wouldn't be able to see me and I'm far too attractive to be kept behind a lectern. <laughs> Honestly, um, I'm not really sure where to start because the thing is, I don't believe doctors have got a right to make a decision about the quality of my life and I don't believe anybody else has got the right to decide the value of my life and whether it should come to an end. I believe I have that decision. I think it's um, frightening people to say that doctors will make these decisions. We very clearly do not want doctors to make decisions about whether somebody's life is unbearable, 
whether it's unreasonable for them to continue living, that decision is down to the person living it. And at the moment, the law is a mess. The law states that to aid, abet, counsel or procure the suicide of another is illegal and punishable by 14 years in jail. So far, the people who have been assisted to go to Switzerland, for instance, to make use of their laws, nobody has been prosecuted. That doesn't mean that's to say that nobody will be, but nobody has yet. In terms of assisting somebody to die, that there have been a number of cases where people have been prosecuted for assisting or for not helping to keep somebody alive, and a number of cases where people have not been prosecuted. What we need is clarity. As citizens of this country, we are entitled to know what our laws mean and how they will be um, used by um, the instruments of that law, whether that's the police or the Crown Prosecution Service or whoever. And the fact that politicians have so far lacked the courage to discuss the issue is not a reason to say it shouldn't be discussed. <laughs> Thank you. The law that we currently are governed by was introduced in 1961, and I think it is a progressive, good, intelligent law for 1961. The one that made suicide, it ceased to be illegal, but still said that assisting a suicide was. But that law was framed in 1961. That's before I was born, before my husband was born, and I would take a guess looking around, I can't see many people, but before a lot of you were born as well. And that although I think it's important that the law be looked at seriously, and I think passing a law quickly, or on the basis of you know, a short discussion or one or two cases, would be a mistake, I think it's the fact that politicians have not yet discussed it is not to say that the current law is an appropriate law and one that you and I wish to be governed by. That every, since 1961, what's changed? Homosexuality has been legalized, not made compulsory, I hasten to add. Abortion has been legalized, but not made compulsory. We've had the war in Vietnam. Nelson Mandela was arrested charged and spent 27 years in jail before being freed to become the first black president of South Africa. 1961 is a long time ago, and I think our, our law, our politicians have got a duty to us as citizens to look at the laws and make sure that they represent our best interests in this century, and not to say that whatever we've got is probably okay, because it's out of date. That this year, um, the General Medical Council have said that uh, some research that was done by Clive Seeley, I'm really sorry, by the way, I can't read. Um, my eyesight's horrible. Um, by Clive Seeley, um, was that of those deaths that were presided over by physicians, 0.2% were assisted to die after, their ex after the patient's express request. 0.3% were assisted to die not with their express request. That means 2,500 deaths every year fall outside of the current law. I'm not saying that therefore, and that's just doctors, I'm not saying that those people should be prosecuted I'm saying that that means we should look again at the law to develop a law which is appropriate for this citizenship in this decade of this century and that we should stop being curtailed by the fact that 50 years ago the politicians had enough courage to look at a law and say we've got to update this. When this law was passed, if you were told you had cancer, you pretty much had a death sentence. Now that's not true. The majority of people who were told they have cancer 
have access to amazing palliative care, amazing care by doctors who can help them live longer and live productive lives and after, I think it's five years or six years of being free of cancer, be told they are cured. That I'm not saying that we should ignore that or go back on that. What I'm saying is that as members of this society, we have a right to be taken seriously that our views on our own lives should be considered as important. And the fact that our politicians who represent us are too cowardly to take up the issue and discuss it is not an indication that they're right, but rather an indication that we have to fight harder and that we have a right to be represented by people who represent our interests. If it is to say that it is okay to kill somebody in war, but not okay to assist somebody to die who wants to be assisted, who is suffering unbearably in excruciating pain or finding their lives unbearable for whatever reason, it's a strange world that we are saying to kill somebody because they happen to live in the wrong country is okay, but to assist somebody to ease their suffering is not. We have to be prepared to look at the legal situation we find ourselves in and that whilst I think palliative care has improved enormously, I think it still has a long way to go and I'm prepared to fight with my last breath that palliative care should be available across the board irrespective of what disease you happen to have to make sure that people have the best care that is available in this society. But saying that does not mean that I believe palliative care is always good enough or always provide, some, provide a solution where people would find living an acceptable situation. That some, it's rational that if some people find that certain situations are beyond their tolerance, it is possible that we could have the same symptom and Emily finds it completely bearable and completely acceptable and that I find it unbearable and unacceptable and it should be our choice, not doctors, not family members, not um, a doctor, not a politician, not a member of parliament, but ourselves who make that decision. And if we look, if we look at what's happening at the moment, of people traveling to Switzerland, people making botched attempts at suicide and ending up in a worse situation than they were before, um, doctors making decisions about the possible end of somebody's life. What it means is this is happening at the moment and in order for this to be properly brought under control in a way that we as a society find acceptable, we have to be prepared to make a law that is acceptable in the United Kingdom in the 21st century, not count on Belgium or Switzerland or Holland or Oregon or anywhere else, but what is acceptable to us. Thank you very much indeed. Our second speaker against the motion is Patrick Stone, Paddy to his friends. He's Macmillan Reader in Palliative Medicine at St George's University of London. He was awarded his MD in cancer-related fatigue and his special interests include prognostication in advanced cancer and quality of life assessment. Paddy Stone. Thank you very much. Good evening. Let me start by explaining that I am a specialist in palliative medicine. I am a hospice doctor. Every year, I look after approximately 1,000 patients who are dying, 
from advanced diseases such as cancer, motor neurone disease, or dementia. If the opinion polls are to be believed, the majority of the people in this country, and presumably the majority of people in this auditorium, are in favor of assisted suicide for the terminally ill. And yet those same opinion polls repeatedly show that the overwhelming majority of palliative care doctors like myself are opposed. And what I want to do this evening is try to explain to you some of the reasons why that might be the case. I think the first thing to state is that although I look after many, many patients who are dying, very few of them actually request assistance with dying. And those requests that I do receive, as Professor uh, Emily Jackson alluded to, are often motivated by fear, fear of what the future might hold. And the commonest fear that I encounter is that patients will be subjected to a burdensome medical intervention at the end of their lives, that they will be put on drips, that they will be ventilated, that they will be tube fed. These are the things that people are frightened of. So the first thing that I say to patients is that there is no need for them to seek an assisted death. There is no need for them to campaign to change the law. They are quite within their rights to refuse any life-prolonging treatment that they choose to do so if they are terminally ill, or indeed at any stage of their life. But since the 2005 Mental Capacity Act, they can go further than that. They can write legally binding advanced refusals of treatment. They can even appoint lasting powers of attorney to trusted relatives or friends to make these decisions on their behalf. There is no need for anybody in this country to be exposed to meddlesome medical intervention at the end of their lives. The second most common fear that I encounter is a fear of pain or a traumatic death, as has been alluded to. I think as a palliative care doctor, I find this particularly hard because I've looked after thousands of patients and by the, the overwhelming majority of patients with good palliative care can achieve a dignified, peaceful and painless death. And I think a, a good example of how misinformation about what can happen at the end of life can influence decision making is provided by the example of patients with motor neurone disease in the Netherlands. In that country, one in five patients with that condition currently seek an assisted death, euthanasia or assisted suicide. And the commonest reason that they give is a fear of choking to death. That is not what happens to patients with motor neurone disease. The overwhelming evidence from studies looking at how patients die with motor neurone disease is that they can die a peaceful and a painless death. Less than half of 1% of all reported deaths in motor neurone disease have any element of choking. And experience in hospices and palliative care has shed, shown that even in those extreme circumstances, judicious use of morphine and sedation can relieve any distress. But we're left with a situation where 20% of people with that condition in the Netherlands are availing themselves of an assisted death because of fear about what the future might hold. I think as a palliative care doctor, I'm also entirely skeptical of the idea that by restricting assisted dying to the terminally ill, we will somehow make it safer or less controversial. In my clinical practice, the terminal phase of an illness relates specifically to the last few hours or days of life. And I know that for, for everybody at that stage of their illness, we can make them comfortable. Because even in the most extreme and dire of circumstances, we could render patients unconscious if that were necessary and keep them comfortable until they died from their underlying disease. There is no need for patients to suffer at the very end of life. What would be gained by legalizing assisted suicide for those patients would be a small amount of extra autonomy to choose the hour or the day on which they died. But is that sufficient justification for exposing large numbers of vulnerable patients to increased risk? What risk? But perhaps, 
But perhaps, I shall, we have questions later, sir. But perhaps the uh, proponents of assisted dying are not suggesting that we restrict it to people in the last few hours or days of life. Perhaps they're suggesting that we should allow it for people in the last few weeks, months, or years of life. And indeed, uh, in the Netherlands, there is a campaign currently to allow uh, euthanasia and assisted dying for the old, uh, the lonely, those who are tired of life. Once you move away from a, a close a definition of the terminal phase as being the last few hours or days, it becomes an entirely fluid concept altogether. After all, life itself could be considered to be a terminal illness. Moreover, doctors themselves are very poor at prognosticating. In a recent study, doctors were asked to categorise whether patients with advanced cancer would live for weeks, months or years. And they only got their categorization right in just over 50% of cases. That's slightly better than the toss of a coin. I'm also highly skeptical of the idea that assisted suicide can be considered to be something hermetically sealed and distinct from euthanasia. Imagine the proponents of assisted suicide have their way, and I've pre prescribed a drug, a lethal cocktail, to one of my patients who's taken half of the medication and slipped into a coma and is now suspended in front of me, somewhere between life and death and perhaps in some pain or discomfort. Surely these same proponents would now argue that it would only be ethical, it would only be proper, it would only be humane to allow me to finish off the job. Would it not? Assisted suicide evolving inevitably into euthanasia. And if you think that's a contrived or unrealistic example, in the Netherlands, one in five cases of assisted suicide ends with the prescription of a lethal injection by the doctor. The clear distinction between assisted suicide and euthanasia is wholly illusory. Finally, I think I'm frightened and concerned that if we legalized assisted suicide, it would have significant adverse effects on the whole culture and practice of medicine and the trust that we rely on with our vulnerable patients. If it was a legal for, to uh, assist people in their suicide, we would have to treat that as just one other option for patients at the end of life. We would be obliged to discuss, uh, for instance, Mr. Jones, we've diagnosed your advanced cancer. We can offer you chemotherapy. Uh, we could offer you good palliative care, but I'm obliged to remind you that you could also avail yourself of an assisted suicide. In a culture like this, how long do you think it would be before the rights of a minority to choose the hour and the day on which they die is transformed into a, a duty or a, at least, at the very least, an expectation or an obligation on the vulnerable majority to accept an assisted death? Thank you for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Patty Stern, thank you very much. Our last speaker in favour of the motion that assisted suicide should be legalised is Mary Warnock, the moral philosopher. She's a former headmistress of Oxford High School and a mistress of Girton College, Cambridge. She's long been an outspoken proponent of voluntary euthanasia, and she said she believes it is genuinely wicked of doctors to disregard the wishes of someone who explicitly wishes to die. Baroness Warnock. Thank you very much. It's very difficult to come after all the other speakers because one keeps on thinking of things one wants to change about what one was going to say oneself. And some of the things I have changed, but one thing I haven't changed, I wanted to divide what I was going to say into two parts. One of them concerned with the law and one of them... Yes, I'm rather short. Um, <laughs> I run as I'm concerned with more, perhaps, fundamental questions. I feel very hesitant in talking about the law at all in the presence of the formidable um, lawyer we've just heard. 
but um, I will have to mention the law. And one of the things I feel most grateful to Libby Purdy for is that her limited, limited success, um, which got the Director of Public Prosecutions to set out his guidelines earlier this year, has shown that the law is really in a tangle in this country. And I think one thing is certain, and that is that whatever one's views are, the law has to be changed sooner or later. Because at the moment, we have the situation where in this country, if somebody assists somebody else to die, at whatever stage of their illness, and I don't terribly like confining us to terminal illness, because I asked Debbie and she told me that she does not regard herself as terminally ill, but she is incurably ill. So we're not necessarily talking about the last two or three days of life. We're talking also about people who know that their illness will not be cured. Um, but in this country, the law lays down that assisted suicide is a criminal offence. And moreover, the present law has made things worse because it's confused the case of somebody who helps somebody to commit suicide or, if you like, kills them out of compassion and pity and not being able to bear their suffering with those people who on the internet incite young people to commit suicide together or in droves or with a partner. Now that seems to me genuinely a terrible offence. But it's nothing whatever to do with the people who probably reluctantly help somebody to do what they want to do, which is end their life. But the present law has merged those two things together and I think that is a disaster and has got to be undone. But the second thing about the law is that it seems to be saying there is a consistent suicide in this country is a criminal offence, but if you go abroad, it's okay. Now, that is an incredibly legalistic view. It's okay in Switzerland because the law says it's okay in certain circumstances. It's not okay here because the law says that it's not. But surely behind the law that would criminalise assisted suicide is a moral judgement about whether it is, in certain circumstances, right, or whether it's never right to help somebody to do what they want to do, which is die when they've had enough. And therefore, I think it trivialises the issue to say it's all right if you go to Switzerland, but not all right here. It's a kind of absurd extension of the concept of not in my backyard. Perfectly all right if you go to Switzerland. Now, I think that is a condition of the law with which we can't ultimately live. We've got to sort things out. And of course, the other thing that's wrong with the law is that the Director of Public Prosecution's guidelines were directed towards people like Debbie's husband, who will, in the end, when she wants it, help her to die, and is laying out the circumstances in which he will escape prosecution. But this has nothing to do and nothing to say about doctors and professional medical people who may feel themselves that it would be morally right to hasten the death of somebody who desperately wants to die because of their pain, discomfort, humiliation, shame, thoroughly feeling fed up with the life they're living. And so I now want to talk about those medical people who find themselves in this position. It seems to me that I'm not talking at all about autonomy or anybody's right to die or right to determine when they die. I don't believe that people have that right. I don't, I, there is a huge number of cases where patient autonomy is restricted and rightly restricted. You can't choose 
what treatment you're going to have, however expensive it is. You can't choose what doctor you're going to have to look after unless you're rich enough to pay for a particular doctor. You have to take what comes. If you live in a particular part of the country, you can't choose to have one kind of drug for your high blood pressure because in that part of the country you'll find that it's been deemed too expensive and you're given another. You have all kinds of restrictions on your choice as a patient. So I'm not relying on the argument for autonomy. But what I am relying on is the fact that although the people of whom we've just heard a good and professional exponent say that palliative care is the solution and that nobody need die a horrible death, that actually does not conform to experience. It may be that most cancer patients have access to palliative care either in a hospice or at home, but not everybody dies of cancer. And there are many, many kinds of horrible deaths, some of them connected with old age as well as disease, some of them connected with all kinds of lung conditions, not necessarily cancer, that inhibit breathing, lots of them connected with the inability to swallow. And I admit that a lot of the horror of this kind of death is fear. And sometimes fear can be allayed, sometimes it can't. But palliative care, I'm sure, is wonderful when it works, but it doesn't always work. And there are people who are rarely longing to die. And I don't see any moral justification whatsoever for the moral opinions of one lot of people, namely the doctors and perhaps the lawyers, to override their own moral opinion, which is that they have had enough and it would be right and good that they should be allowed to die in peace. Now, I think that what I'm asking for is ultimately a change of the law that makes assisted suicide in this kind of case, as well as in the case of Debbie here, um, legal in some situations. But I'm asking first for a change in the attitude of the medical profession. And actually, I think there is evidence that this is gradually coming about. Because I do believe that medical people, for whom, on the whole, I have the largest, enormous admiration, partly because of being dependent on them, as we all are, but I do have a great admiration for them. But I think that they do believe that their mission, and I use the word advisedly, that their mission is to help people, to make things better for people, to make their lives better rather than worse. And I believe that what we need is a change of attitude in the medical profession, which may come to think that living longer is not always in the best interest of the patient. Life <coughs> is sometimes less desirable than death. We are all going to die, and doctors know that as well as anybody else, or better. But yet they're incredibly reluctant to talk about the fact that somebody is dying. They don't use the word dying. They treat people as if they were all the same, all waiting to be cured or made better. Or if they can't be cured or made better, then palliative care is what they draw out of the hat. But supposing that palliative care doesn't work, supposing that the person is, let's say, very old, knows that they maybe have been cured from some disease by drugs and whatnot, but yet knows that they're not really better, they're going to die, and die soon. Could it not become part of the doctor's repertoire to think that how to help their patient, how to make things better for 
that patient would be to help her to die, to make things easier, to bring death on rather than constantly hold it at bay. Would this not perhaps be the conclusion of compassion? And so what I'm referring to is not anything to do with rights or autonomy. It's not even anything to do with the law because the argument of people who, lawyers and others who are against this is often, but the law would be abused. The horrible predatory relatives would come sweeping in and say, go on, get rid of her. She's, she's using up our money. She's using up our time, so on and so forth. Well, of course, there may be horrible predatory relatives. Any law can be abused. You could refuse to give anyone in childbirth pethidine on the ground that somebody could give them too much pethidine and they die. Or they might become addicted to pethidine and go on taking pethidine for the rest of their lives. Any law can be abused, but that cannot be a reason for not thinking of the moral arguments that lie behind the law and indeed lie behind any law. Bernice, and the I law here Bernice, is well, compassion. Thank you very much indeed. And our final speaker uh, against changing the law is Richard Harries, Bishop of Oxford for 19 years, familiar to us all from Radio 4's Thought for the Day. He's Gresham Professor of Divinity at King's College London, a man with a passion for social justice. He's currently writing a book entitled Issues of Life and Death. Richard Harris. Good evening, everybody. Like everybody else, uh, I very much uh, feel for people who are in the grip of irremediable and irreversible uh, suffering. And I really genuinely don't know how I would feel or how I would react if I was in that situation myself, suffering from a debilitating illness. Emily earlier on said, uh, I would uh, not want to continue living. I can sympathize with that. But if I was in that position, I just simply don't know how I would react. And the reason I mentioned this right at the beginning is to make it clear that I don't approach this debate with any claim uh, to be uh, on the high moral ground or to be some kind of moral hero. Uh, like every other human being, I'm frail and uh, fearful. Uh, and because others uh, have considered the issue from medical and legal standpoints, I'm going to raise some wider considerations, if I may, about what it really means to be a human being in society. However, once again, I must make it clear that I'm not depending on any moral law against what Hamlet called self-slaughter, nor uh, on any idea that it is God and God alone who decides the moment of our death. Those may or may not be good arguments, but I want to make it quite clear, those are not the arguments that I am deploying now. What I want to do is to question some all-pervading assumptions in our society as a whole, and particularly in this debate, about what it really means to be human. And I think that res the research on what has happened in Oregon is very re revealing because it shows that people who take up the option of assisted dying are those who like to be in control of their lives. Those in the age range 18 to 64 are three times more likely to avail themselves of Oregon's Death with Dignity Act than the over 85 group. In short, it is those who've recently led busy professional lives, those who've recently been in, uh, active in control, who want to choose the moment of their death, and it is n and not the most elderly. Now, I'd like to suggest that this picture is, in fact, a very revealing one, and it fits in with what Emily said earlier on, that there is a particular subset of people who want more control over their lives. 
but I think that it reveals three assumptions. First of all, a very individualistic assumption of what it is to be a human being in society. It is, as it were, the lonely individual deciding for him or herself. And it is this view, of course, which has dominated European culture since the 17th century, which is focused particularly uh, in somebody like Kierkegaard. The fact is, however, we're not isolated individuals. And I think the Africans have a much richer and deeper understanding when they talk about Ubuntu. We are persons only in and through our relationship with other uh, persons. Now the second assumption which is revealed by the Oregon picture, which I think uh, reveals something about our society, uh, and that is the assumption that it is the ability to control our lives that defines us as human beings. Now again, I'd like it to make it quite clear. I like to be in control of my lives uh, as much as anybody in this room, perhaps even more so. I hate the thought of not being in control uh, of my life. But I have to face the fact at the beginning of my life, I was totally dependent on others. At the very end of my life, I'm inevitably bound to be totally dependent on our other, uh, others. The fact of the matter is that we are interdependent uh, and that the relationship between being dependent and being interdependent are intertwined and vary greatly during the course of our lives. And it's quite wrong to simply define us as human beings in terms of our ability to control and manipulate our lives. And the third false assumption, which I think is revealed with the Oregon picture, uh, is that if we actually lose control of our lives and become more dependent on others, somehow we lose our value and dignity as human beings. Now, of course, we don't. Every human being, in whatever state, is of value to be respected and cherished as such. So I want to begin, therefore, by, by asking you, if you would, to, to question uh, the widespread assumption in our society, which has really been going since the 17th century, that it is us as lonely individuals in control of our lives who really define what it is to be us. Nevertheless, even if you concede that, you might very rightly say, but there are people who really want to die. This is their considered choice, and they're asking for our help to do so. And of course, we've heard very, very powerful pleas this evening along those lines. But here again, if I may, I'd like to suggest three points which should make us hesitate very greatly. First of all, of course, it's not always morally right to do what other people ask you to do. I imagine that everybody in this room, if they were faced with a teenager who asks you to help them to die, would refuse. Of course we would refuse. We would seek uh, to, to, to help them in some other ways. We would look around for some other way uh, of alleviating their di distress. And we would regard it as profoundly wrong to help a teenager to kill themselves. But then, all right, suppose someone in a desperate state blurts out, blurts, out, blurts out, as they have done, well, you wouldn't treat a dog like this. You have your dog put down to end their suffering. Why won't you do the same for me? a very heartfelt plea, and I, I don't in any way question the real pain uh, uh, behind it. But the point is, quite simply, we're not dogs. We are human beings. When a dog is in great pain at the end of their life, the kindest thing you can do is indeed simply to end their pain by putting them down. Now, in relation to human beings, of course, we ought to do all we can to relieve a person's pain. And Paddy has told us all that can be uh, done now. And thank God, through the great advances in palliative care, in almost every case, it is possible for a person to die uh, peacefully. But the point is that relieving pain is not the only thing which we owe to other human beings in their distress. We want to assure them that they're still of value and that they're still wanted. Now, there is an extreme situation which is sometimes put forward in this dis debate. A petrol tank has gone up in flames. The driver's caught in his cab and is going to roast to an excruciating death. There's no way you can get him out and he begs you to shoot him. Now, I think that in that situation, it is entirely morally right to accede to his request and to shoot him because his death from burning is certain, immediate, and horrific. 
But the people who seek assistance in dying are not in that position. They're still very much with us. And we, what we can offer them is not just as much alleviation of their pain and distress as possible, but the assurance that we're still with them, that we will accompany them on their journey, and that in this journey, they, their continuing presence with us is still of value. Now, the great American ethicist Paul Ramsey, in his discussion of ending the lives of people uh, diagnosed with permanent vegetative state and other similar conditions, suggested it would be right, let us say, to inject a person in that state with a lethal drug if, quotes, they are irretrievably inaccessible to human care. But in other circumstances, he said, we should not, quote, hasten them from the here and now in which they still claim a faithful presence from us. I find that a very powerful phrase. We shouldn't hasten them from the here and now in which they still claim a faithful presence for us. For if we hasten them from the here and now, away from us and their continuing presence with us, what in, is it in fact that we are saying to them? This is not an argument from selfishness, as though it is we who cannot bear to let them go. It is about assuring them that they still have a place, that we want to accompany them on their journey, and that they still are value. And the great advantage of having a law which uh, does not allow for assisted dying it, is that it assures people in whatever state that they're there, that it's not just an individual, but it is a whole society as a whole, which their values, their, 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 their presence with us. So what I'm asking us to do is to question various assumptions which I think permeate this debate and perhaps which are pretty widespread in our society as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lord Harris. Um, now, before I open it up to the audience, let me just give you the result of the entrance poll. For the motion that assisted suicide should be legalised, 408. Against, 110 don't knows, 117. So there's quite a lot of work to be done by the all males on my left. Um, question time then. Keep it brief if you would because I'm sure lots of people want to get in. Don't make speeches, make a point or ask a question, preferably both as quickly as you can. I'll go to a, a hand I can see up over there and can I have another one here coming up afterwards and I'm coming to you. Okay, thank you. Um, my question is, I don't know how many other people in the room have had to make the choice, but I did, and I couldn't, even though I love my husband very much, and I think it's because it shouldn't be up to the family. So I think, could there be a law that when that situation does arrive, it isn't in the hands of the family? I don't know how many other people have ever had to make that choice for a loved one, but it is incredibly hard. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to take this, uh, another question here, another point here, trying to gather you together in bunches so we can get to see as many as we can. Yes, sir, take the microphone if you would. Thank you. I'd ask, like to ask Bishop Harris. He mentioned that uh, a driver in a train was about to be burned to death. Uh, he would be permitted to shoot him. Uh, what would the law have to say about that? Well, well if, you, if you don't mind, I'm not going to get us diverted onto that because I think it is actually slightly off the point. There was, another, there was another question here. That's it. Well, he can answer it in a minute if you really feel he should, but I, I think it's... Uh, Lord Carlyle, in his very interesting speech, told us a great deal about what the law is, but that is really irrelevant to this debate, which is about what the law ought to be. And... <laughs> Uh, and I think Debbie Purdy, Purdy's example of somebody in insufferable pain which can't be ended does sometimes happen, and plainly that person should be allowed to be killed, not merely starved to death. But I think the speakers for the motion have failed to do something very important, which is to say what the law ought to be. And that has not been defined yet, and I hope perhaps in their closing speeches it will be. Right, well, let me bring in Alex Carlyle on that, and perhaps you can scoop up the burning well, lorry I, driver at the same time. I can, is this microphone working? Yeah. I can scoop up the first question by saying, I did say what the law ought to be. I said it should remain as it is. And I would, to scoop up a brief, previous question, I would leave the law exactly as it is, 
um, in dealing with the uh, driver in the burning cab. It's not that the law should be changed for the driver in the burning cab. Of course the driver would not be prosecuted. We have a benign prosecution process in this country in which a judgment is made by a dual code test which has been recognized time and time again by the courts as having some importance. And I think it's absolutely good enough for the director of public prosecutions to decide not only whether there is evidence, but whether it's in the public interest for the person to be prosecuted. And plainly, the director would decide it was not in the public interest. Now, I didn't quite hear the first question. Well, I'm going to I... ask Debbie to answer yeah, that, okay. won't you? I, D Debbie, the first point was that it shouldn't be up to the family. I agree it shouldn't be up to the family. It should be up to the patient. And I think that what we need to have is, as Terry Pratchett talked about, tribunals, when people are still alive, to be able to discuss why they want to die, to give families the opportunity, if somebody thinks they're a burden, so that families have the opportunity of saying, Auntie May, you're not a burden, we love having you here, so that doctors have got the opportunity of saying that they have a different way of treating people. But if any of those solutions are not sufficient for the patient, the patient should have the right to decide they want to end their lives. And if they can't do that themselves, which <coughs> is often the case, they should be able to ask for assistance. But how can they ask for assistance if they can't do it themselves? I mean, that's the point, isn't it? You come down to that fine moment when perhaps you haven't spoken early enough and you're beyond being able to speak. You have to rely then on your loved one to know what you would want. Is that what you're I, saying? No, I don't. I personally, and this is why I think it's very hard to say exactly what the law should be. I think it should be part of a discussion because my personal belief is that if somebody hasn't specifically said, oh, I want to die now, I don't think anybody else has got the right to make the choices for them. I think it has always got to be the patient who makes the choice. I'll go to a, a question there, and then I'll come to the one on the front row here. Thank you. Hello. Um, I was fortunate enough to live very near Jackie Kennedy Onassis. Much smaller apartment, unfortunately. But anyway, she did die at her own um, wish in her own way, which her son announced the next day. She was famous enough and rich enough to have that choice. An average engineer, school teacher, no way. Secondly, you may all know my terrible accent. I'm sorry for that. I'm sort of an ex-American. The most common cause of bankruptcy in the U.S., what is it? Health care. Your loved ones will sell their diamonds, their homes, whatever. I get nervous, so I have my notes here. Um, in your will, you probably don't know this better than I do, though I have members of my family who are surgeons and lawyers, and I respect very much when one of you said, they're just humans like the rest of us. There's the good, bad, and the medium, like any profession. In your will, should you say which family member decides? Because if you leave it among three or four family members, then what? They'll be in disarray, okay. won't they? I'm, I'm, that, that's Thank enough. For, thank you very much. Should, should you say in your will, in, in, in any kind of will that you might leave, um, Jackie, uh, it, I'm sorry, down at the end there, uh, should you say which family member should take the decision for you? Well, currently, um, the way things work is that you can make, and this is, this is, we're talking about refusal of treatment here, we're not talking about um, assisted dying. You can nominate somebody to make decisions for you when you let, lose capacity, or you can make a living will with your directions for what you want to happen in. So you are currently able to nominate somebody to take decisions once you've lost capacity, but that doesn't apply at all to assisted dying, which is absolutely illegal. Okay, let's have a point from the front here. Um, a couple of points um, to Debbie Purdy. For, um, this is a case of one disabled person to another, by the way. Um, two points. First one, um, you say you want to have autonomy about when you die. Well, with respect, you're not going to have it, because somebody's, unless you're planning that automatically anybody who says they want to die, there's no judge or panel to discuss it, which would be a complete nightmare, and I hope you'd agree about that, then one way or another somebody's going to be deciding for you. There's a second point which I'd like to make, slightly ironically, not a dig at Intelligence Squared, which is to ask how many severely disabled people there are in this room. 
So I, I'll move away from I'm the mic. So how many, sorry. How many I'm severely so, disabled I'm, I'm people just, are We on can't screen? quite hear you. Could you hold the mic? I know, sorry, I moved away from the mic. I was making a point slightly ironically, not a dig at Intelligence Squared, by the way, which is how many severely disabled people there are in this room. There are very good reasons for it not being discussed in Parliament, which is that it's based on a false consensus. The, most, the people most immediately affected, severely disabled people, are the very people who are not going to have a voice because they're very ill. Debbie, come back quickly on that, and then I'm going to move. say I think that is completely wrong. The majority of disabled people, like the majority of able-bodied people, support there being a change in the law because we, as disabled people, don't want to relinquish the control we have over, over our own lives. Of course, there are elements that we will never have control over, and that's just life. But those which we can, we need to. And my Physical disability does not change my ability to make decisions for myself, about myself, and about my own life. And I resent anybody saying that I am um, a poor person that somebody else has got to protect and defend. Sure. Disabled people want to be in control of their own lives, and we have a right to have that same control that everybody else has got. This law does not affect the disabled disproportionately. Richard, <coughs> Richard. I'll just say uh, briefly that in the House of Lords there are a number of uh, disabled peers uh, and they are the strongest opponents of attempts to legalise uh, assisted dying led by uh, Lady Jane Campbell. I'm going to a point from the balcony there, yeah. Um, I think that in these debates you often get um, a lot of pressure for the law to be clarified. Uh, for it to be codified by, by acts of parliament. But I think we have a very long tradition in our law of law always being interpreted um, by the courts and by the director of public prosecutions. And sometimes the pressure to try and clarify everything to the nth degree is actually a damaging um, process to go through. It removes flexibility from the law. Um, but that does leave one thing that does concern me. Does that not put too much power in the hands of one man, i.e., or woman, uh, is not in this case, uh, the, the director of public prosecutions? So are we not in a position where that one man now decides who is prosecuted and who is not? Um, it's, so I, I think the clarification of the law ultimately might be a step backwards, but should there not be a, a wider process about who decides who is prosecuted under this more flexible position that we currently have? Mary Warnock, too much power in the hands of the DPP. Uh, well, I think I agree. I feel anxious about that. But there is an area where I think the law could be more flexible, and I entirely agree that, that this is one of the merits of the law, but if the law of homicide were to be changed so that there was no automatic mandatory life sentence, then I think things would be very much better. I think that if uh, it's a homicide trial, somebody had, uh, was, was prosecuted for ending the life of somebody who was terminally ill and who had wanted to end her life. Supposing this husband were prosecuted, then if the jury could say to the judge, we find that there are mitigating circumstances here which would lift the necessity of the life sentence, then I think this would make an enormous difference. And I believe that that might be the way that the law should be changed, to change the law of homicide. Emily, quick point on this. Um, just, I think the status quo, um, where we have this degree of clarity with the um, DPP having uh, issued factors in favour and against prosecution, in some ways is a good thing, though I, I, t I take the point that sometimes a lack of clarity can have positive effects. But there are two ways in which I think this is problematic. One is the status quo is that we're exporting assisted suicide to Switzerland, and that doesn't seem to me to be the right way to go about this. The second thing is if you can know at the level of prosecution when somebody should be treated as a criminal for assisting a suicide, it doesn't seem to me beyond the bounds of possibility that you could know that at the level of the definition of the offence. Alex Carlyle is whispering to me he wants to say two tiny sentences. Two tiny sentences. One, I agree entirely with Baroness Warnock. 
the mandatory life sentence should be removed. I hope the coalition will do it. There's practically no one in the House of Lords who believes it's justified. And the answer to the gentleman on, in the balcony is the DPP does not have too much power because he's subject to judicial review and is regularly the subject of actions for judicial review. Okay. So his decisions in the end are controlled by the judges. Okay, I'm going to appoint at the back here and then I'm coming back up to the balcony. Yeah. Um, Lord Harris, uh, you spoke very movingly about Ubuntu and accompanying our loved ones um, to the end. You are speaking there for my late mother, who, before her catastrophic stroke at the age of 85, had signed a living will, and who, after the stroke, repeatedly begged me to help her to die. And I know that no greater act of Ubuntu, or whatever you like to call it, no greater act of love um, could have been than helping her um, to, to have a dignified and peaceful death. So are you sure you're speaking for everyone? What, what happened in the end? What, what um, you... um, against all prognostications, it took her nearly six years to die, and she was lonely even though I was there. Richard Harris. Well, I think I can, I can just simply respect your experience and, and suggest that there are other, there are other uh, instances. I mean, I think of my own mother who also had a terrible stroke and couldn't speak properly for the last five or six years of her life. Um, and it was, it was terrible, it was agonizing, but I couldn't say that there were no blessings that came out of it. I couldn't say that. Um, would she have said that if she could have done? Well, she had a huge will to live. I mean, she was a great fighter. She went on fighting to the end. Paddy Stone, you must see these cases every day of the week. I mean, it's, it's obviously, it's always very difficult to comment on individual cases. You know, I, obviously everybody's heart goes out to your individual experience here. But I suppose just at one level, it does illustrate slightly that we're meant to be talking here about legalising assisted suicide for the terminally ill. And, you know, what you just presented there was a case of somebody who, who lived for another six years. Was this patient terminally ill? And I think that's the problem, is that it's impossible to try to regulate something that says it is just for the terminally ill. Once you start introducing this, it becomes, for anybody who's... I mean, most people who suffer a stroke and survive are disabled. They're not terminally ill. Let's point up in the balcony. Thank you. Three quick points. The first one, I think Baroness Warnock must have privileged information that the rest of us doesn't have when she says the natural conclusion of compassion is that death would be better than some cases of life. We don't know what it's going to be like after death. Number one. Number two, I think people mostly said, and I speak as a secular sinner on this part, <laughs> the secondly, you said that uh, most people who are terminal would be like to, allow, like to be allowed to die in peace. I would like to advocate for the increase in hospice care for more people rather than putting our energy into this particular debate. And thirdly, what concerns me is that there are three men in the panel arguing, as I would, that assisted suicide should not be legalized and women arguing for it. Given our relative longevity, there are going to be more single, vulnerable, inarticulate women around who can't argue in the way the honourable people do on the left. And my concern is that this argument can very quickly become a euthanasia argument against vulnerable women. Well, Ma Mary Warnock, I think you better answer first the, the point to you that, that you suggested that death is better in some cases than life. What do you know that uh, we don't know. Well, uh, of course I don't know what death is like, except I, I know it won't be like anything much. But um, <laughs> I don't think life is what is valuable. Life isn't the kind of stuff that is valuable in itself, like gold or platinum or something. There isn't such a thing as life, except life lived by somebody. And if that somebody hates her life or is in absolute misery, then that life has no value for her. Life itself is an abstraction. It's not anything that's valuable. But you and I and everybody in this room is alive and I hope enjoying our life experiences. But if 
we are not, then being alive is not something to value in itself. Debbie. Is, is, is assisted suicide a feminine issue? <laughs> well, it depends how many women are in the room. But I think that on the question of um, the value of life, nobody has the right to place a value on my life other than me. Mm, right. I live it, I can decide, and my disability is not an issue. My disability does not mean that I enjoy life less or that I enjoy life more. It's a fact of who I am, and I'm proud of who I am. And I'm, it's not my disability I'm proud of, it's my mind. And Jane Campbell, I'm sure, will say the same thing, that it isn't that we are able-bodied or disabled. And the majority of terminally ill people in this country are not necessarily disabled. And I think the idea of turning <coughs> what we are talking about into an issue about disability is quite wrong because our abilities are not based on whether or not we are disabled. Right, I'm going to go to a point at the back on my left, followed by a point at the back on my right. Sorry if it's going backward a step, but do the um, against people then actually think it's right that nobody has yet been prosecuted for taking relatives to Switzerland? You're saying, sorry. So do the people who are at, uh, against uh, legalising the assisted suicide think that it's correct that nobody has yet been prosecuted for taking their relatives to Switzerland? Do you, do you think it's right that no one has, has so far been prosecuted for taking their relatives to Switzerland? I think some 90 people or so have taken people to Switzerland and no action has been taken against them, which is exactly, of course, what Debbie had clarified from the DPP. You're asking me? I am. I think it's a matter for the Director of Public Prosecutions to decide. <laughs> and no, no, no. You're, 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 me, being, you're, you being, you're being asked if you think it's wrong that they haven't been prosecuted. Well, I don't know the facts. You know, this is a serious answer. Wait a minute. I, I don't know the facts of the case. Hang on. Hang on. I do not know the facts of a single case that the Director of Public Prosecutions has had to look at I have not looked at the files that the Director of Public Prosecutions has had to look at. I believe, I believe, if I may answer the question without being interrupted, I believe that there are cases in which it may well be right for people to be prosecuted, and I expect, actually, rather more people to be prosecuted than have been in the past as a result of the clarity that is being given to the law as a result of Debbie Purdy's excellent court action. You expect more people to be prosecuted yes, as a result? Yes, I do. How, I, I, do I, well, if one were to... St you have to take as your starting point when the DPP's policy was put into place. And I believe that the DPP's policy has given a, a, a considerable amount of clarity to the law and that, as a result, if you read it, you will find that certain people are likely to be prosecuted. For example, people who have a substantial financial gain or people who have put the person who has died under any sort of pressure. But I'm afraid, like everything in the criminal law, every case is different. It's but, a matter of evidence. But it was clear before, was it not, that anyone who assisted someone to commit suicide was actually contravening the law. Yet 90 people have gone uh, to Switzerland and have helped someone commit suicide, and they haven't been prosecuted. Well, you're, you're, you're actually making a sweeping generalisation, if I may say so, because... I don't know what those 90 people did. I don't know if, as a matter of law, for example, helping someone to buy a ticket to go to Switzerland is assisting suicide. In, as a matter in, of law, I rather doubt it. In, in, in the eyes of the DPP, none of them did anything wrong, it would seem. Well, the DPP judges the cases on the evidence. You know, what's wrong with that? Qu quick point from Emily here. Just to say, um, there have been cases where he set out his decision in, ex in extraordinary detail, and booking a ticket does satisfy the evidential burden for assisting. So he said that does, um, but there have been no cases where the public interest has been served. Is there anyone in the room who would like to add a point at this moment to support Alex Carlyle and his arguments? Just put your hands down if you're doing the opposite for a moment. Is there anyone who would like to make a point on this side? Sorry, we can't hear you. Can, you. can we get a microphone to you? Is, hold on, hold on, hold on, because the people online won't hear you, even if we can. 
are you asking for general arguments in favour of that, what they're arguing in general, or are you arguing in particular the arguments he's made? Well, I think I'm asking for an argument that supports this side. Well, that would be... Uh, I can okay. give you one. Okay, on you go. Okay. Um, I think it would have been helped, actually, in this debate had we had more specific proposals from that side uh, for exactly how they would legalise assisted suicide. Generally, the argument in favour of assisted suicide is for the Oregon model, as I understand it, the, the campaigns for it in this country. Well, in that case, if you are arguing for that, and it would be helpful if you would say if you are, then you really have to um, argue why um, it would not fall into the problem that Dr Stone has mentioned of where a right to die soon becomes a duty to die. It's not just a matter uh, for Miss Purdy and people like her, it's for those who are much more vulnerable than Miss Purdy. Um, actually, the Oregon State Public Health Division brings out an annual report every year since the legalization of assisted suicide in Oregon. In 1998, 13% of all the people who committed assisted suicide uh, did it because they felt they would be a burden on their families. Within 10 years, 2007, this had got more than tripled to 44.9% of people who are committing assisted suicide because they felt they were a burden. Is that really a voluntary, autonomous decision? Debbie? The rates of people who use the law in Oregon is around 100 a year. So it's not like there's a mass number of people who want to end their lives. And a lot of people in Oregon have the ability to then talk to people, talk to their family, talk to their friends, talk to their physicians about their decision to have an assisted death. And quite often, the rates of requesting and gaining assisted death are lower than the rates of suicide in other, um, other states because people are able to explore what other options are available to them. It is too late when somebody is dead to discuss whether or not to prosecute the person who assisted them. We have to do that discussion in advance of somebody dying and the kind of tribunals that Terry Pratchett talked about to explore the opportunities that doctors can alleviate pain, that your social situation can be changed, that family members have the ability to say you're not a burden. Okay. That's what we need. Okay, we're moving towards a summing up, but I promised someone at the back there. Yes, quick point if you yes. would. Um, I'd just like to um, draw on something that Dr. Stone said, and that's the distinction between killing and letting die. It's not something that's really been discussed. Between far. killing and what? Killing and letting die. Um, it's something that James Rachel discusses quite a lot. So basically, at the moment, it's okay for a doctor to say that they are going to withhold treatment, but it's um, it's not okay to say administer a lethal injection to to produce the same effect. And to me, this just seems like a completely inadequate distinction, both legally and morally, because not only are you subjecting them to more suffering, but also, surely, if you've got a duty of care, you've got a duty of care. And if you're going to let them die, okay. then you're you're killing them either way. Okay. And I'm going to take another point here. <laughs> If you could bring the microphone quickly down to this gentleman here who's had his hand up for a very long time. Gentleman just at the back there, and then I'm going to call for Thanks. some summing up. First, I agree with the lady who just asked the last question. Um, but for Alex Carlyle, you were saying there's about 90 cases of people who've taken their relatives to Switzerland, um, I think, and you haven't looked into them. And you're a lawyer, and you're the joint head of a public policy think tank that's supposed to research assisted suicide. Shouldn't you have looked into them? You said you haven't read the files. Well, I, th I think we've been around that one, so I think what I'll do is I'll call for some, I'll call for some summing up now and uh, ask you to vote while we do. Um, we're going to ask you to vote while we do it. It's slightly unfair because you don't get to hear the summing up, and I'm sorry that we can't have any more points. I'm really sorry about that. Um, but I guess it's better than asking you to sit around um, with your stomachs rumbling. So the ushers will be coming around with the ballot boxes if you could get your votes ready, ripping the tickets in half. Let's have the summings up in the reverse order. Richard Harries first, please. Um, well, first, let me, just, if I may, just sort of state some fundamentals of uh, a Christian moral approach to this subject in order to try to dispel uh, a certain uh, number of misconceptions. The first of all, we're under no obligation to prolong life as far as possible. The 19th century poet uh, Clough was once quoted by a pope out of context, thou shalt not kill but need not strive officiously to keep alive. And that's a very good summary, I think, 
uh, of a humane Christian approach to this. There's no obligation to go on prolonging life. Secondly, as Paddy mentioned, we have the right, the moral right, uh, and the legal right to refuse burdensome uh, treatment. And the second uh, point is in relation to, as it were, uh, killing and, and simply letting, letting die. It is fundamental to Christian moral theology as well as good medical practice uh, that it is entirely right to give somebody a dose of painkillers to relieve their pain, even though it may have the effect of shortening their life. And there's a very profound moral difference between that and deliberately injecting a drug which will, will kill them. And what I'd like to suggest is that if one takes these considerations into account, together with advanced, the possibility of having an advanced directive, which was meant earlier on, and good palliative care, there is absolutely no need to change the law in order to make it possible for people to seek help in assisting dying. Thank you very much. Mary Warnock. I think that Richard now, and during the course of the discussion, some people do um, rather sanitize what it's like dying. I don't think that, for one thing, there are many people, or there are a lot of people who don't feel that at the end of their life they're going to be comforted by having a lot of other people around them. I think a lot of us feel that as we get more and more feeble and undignified, we want to be left alone to die. But secondly, I really don't think that the um, stuff about um, double effect and it being okay to give someone a dose that'll kill them, they will know perfectly well it'll kill them, but your intention was to um, relieve their pain. I simply do not believe in the morality of that antique argument. Um, I don't, and anyway, I don't think it's necessary because nowadays people are much better at distinguishing different drugs which actually sedate people or kill them. I would like to argue in my own case, that if I can't stand living anymore, I should be given terminal sedation. It wouldn't make any difference to me whether I was dead or terminally sedated, but at least it would be relieve the conscience of the doctors and save me from suffering. Paddy Stone. I, th I think uh, just uh, briefly I would say that um, although palliative care can uh, alleviate much of the fear and the uh, distress associated with dying, I would not stand here and say to you that it will remove all of the demands for assisted suicide. I'm not that naive. And the main reason for that is that patients choose. Patients make autonomous decisions that they want to end their life, and no amount of palliative care will actually get rid of those few requests from the few patients who want to choose the hour and the day on which they die. My question to you is, is that worth changing the law to expose the large number of vulnerable patients who I look after on a daily basis to expose them to increased risk of having their lives shortened? That's the decision that's before you. Debbie Purdy. <laughs> People have talked about a slippery slope as if we are inevitably going to roll down it. The law is a crampon that can be used to stop that. If we have a law, and I don't believe it's beyond our collective um, you know, ability to devise a law that will provide the security and the protection that people want, as well as providing the relief and the security that people need. And I think that um, the only way we can do that is if Parliament gets its head up and starts looking at the issues and stops leaving it to an unelected official like the Director of Public Prosecutions. I think he's done a wonderful job in the guidelines, but he is an unelected um, he is an appointed official. It's not his role and it's not his right to make legal um, situations that the rest of us are bound by. We vote for our um, MPs to do that and they should do it. I think that um, what we need is an open discussion and I think 
this kind of discussion is what is valuable. I don't believe that one side has all the answers, and I don't think anybody has the monopoly on the truth. I think that has to be discussed, and I think the protection that is offered is huge. If we have a proper law which discusses the rights and wrongs, the possibilities and not possibilities, and allows and encourages doctors and people of the cloth and social workers to be involved in that decision-making process and family, that decision-making process when somebody is alive and not leave it until after they're dead. Alex Collar. Four short points. The first, it has been said repeatedly that the law is in a mess. The law is not in a mess. The law is clear. The Director of Public Prosecutions has published a policy as requested uh, and instructed by the Supreme Court. And in my view, it is a proper part of our common law system that there should be a civilized exercise of discretion within a clear law to decide whether it is in the public interest on the evidence in an individual case whether it should be prosecuted. The second point is related to that. We've heard it said repeatedly that a law can be devised to deal with the problem that is raised by this motion. But we've been there time and time again. We've had two debates. We've actually had three debates in the House of Lords. We've had two votes. Numerous attempts have been made to try and devise a law, and not one of those attempts has produced a law that compares with any, any compares properly with the certainty of the law as it is. So there is no alternative produced for us debate, to debate, and none has been produced today. Third point, Debbie Purdy said very powerfully that things have changed since 1961, and she cited a number of examples. I would say to her, that they have nothing to do with the issue that we're dealing with, Debbie, and let's just think about some things that may have something to do with the issue. What's happened, among other things, since 1961? The murder rate has increased. Dr. Shipman has been convicted, a medical doctor, of killing a very large number of people. The Staffordshire case occurred in which a nurse was convicted of killing a number of people. Palliative medicine has developed a pace. Doctors have greater skills and, I think, Paddy, a wider range of drugs that they can use in different ways. And a good death is therefore far more possible in the face of a serious illness than was the case in 1961. And the fourth point I want to make very strongly because nobody has addressed it at all in this debate. I tried to mention, to mention it when I started. Nobody has discussed the effect on the person who is required to assist the suicide. That person has a very great burden placed upon them. It's not just a legal burden, it's a moral burden. And I think we have to, in a debate like this, if we're really going to reach an educated and intelligent result, debate the effect on the person who actually is asked or required to assist the suicide. Thank you very much. And finally, as we wait for our result, Emily Jackson. Um, two very brief points about the difference between killing and letting die, which our, our law is enshrined uh, in at the moment. One is, the point's been made, if you're being fed through a tube, you have an absolute right to insist that doctors do something which will inevitably lead to your death. That makes the right to medical help dependent on the morally arbitrary presence of a, a peg tube. People with feeding tubes may be vulnerable and they may believe that they're a burden but they have the right to demand that doctors do that. The second thing I wanted to say about the killing and letting die distinction is that letting die isn't always okay. Letting die can sometimes be very wrong indeed. Indeed, it can sometimes amount to murder. Um, if you imagine a villainous, racist, a uh, paediatric uh, nurse finding herself alone in an intensive care ward who was to withdraw the feeding tubes from all of the non-white babies in that ward. That would be murder. The fact that she's letting them die from their pre previous inability to breathe doesn't excuse that action. So letting die can be wrong, and I would say the converse is true. Causing death can sometimes be the right thing to do. In terms of what a law would, would include, I would have a palliative care filter, a social support filter, compulsory psychiatric assessment, unbearable suffering 
that can't be relieved. It's not going to be easy to draft an effective assisted dying law, but I think we owe it to the people who do suffer unbearably to try. Well, we're, we're still awaiting the result. It's obviously a closer run thing than the entry poll anyway, so maybe, gentlemen, on the left, you've had a deal of effect this evening. Just while we're waiting for it, we, what hasn't come up this evening, it strikes me, is the terminology. And I wonder, Richard Harris, if you would care to um, uh, speak to that. Uh, you know, the point is that assisted suicide is quite, a, quite an emotional, quite a, a nasty term, really. Surely voluntary euthanasia is a better term, or assisted well, dying is another. Well, uh, euthanasia, I take... Uh, I mean, th these are slippery terms. They can be defined in different ways. Uh, I mean, euthanasia, I take it, is when the doctor administers the drug, and euthanasia can either be voluntary or involuntary. It either can be the result of request or, as in Nazi Germany, because the government wanted it. Assisted dying, I think, as we have it in the Oregon model, is that the person who's assisted, who wants to die, administers the drug themselves. They get it from the doctor, but they admit it, admit, administer it themselves. That's how I make the distinction. But the word suicide, is, is, implies a kind of confusion and despair, whereas assisted suicide presumably is done in faith. Well, the word suicide, of course, is a very emotive term, um, and because uh, suicide has been associated with being a very uh, uh, severe uh, criminal act and suicides until the 19th century were buried at the crossroads and so on, I think people quite rightly have moved away to less emotive language. So we talk about assisted dying or euthanasia, either voluntary or involuntary, and I think that's probably uh, helpful, and it is probably... Uh, better to use the, the word, confine the word suicide to other instances where it is, it, it is obvious that a person uh, has committed suicide for, for various reasons which are non-medical and are not terminal and so on. What's your preferred option, Debbie, as, of terminology? I prefer to call assisted dying because the one thing you can absolutely guarantee, apart from taxes, is that none of us is getting out of here alive. And... If you are in unbearable pain, whether that pain is physical or emotional, if you ask for assistance to end your life, that is assisted dying. I think that um, terminology is quite different. Um, and I would say that um, the fact that I'm not terminally ill does not mean that my life will necessarily not become unbearable. But it might not be. And that's why I think we should make sure that we have proper laws that are in place. But there is another point about assisted suicide, which is <coughs> that there are some people who simply can't, physically can't commit suicide, can't take the drug themselves. And therefore, if one were going to change the law um, and allow some people to be assisted in dying, one would have to make accommodation for the Diane Blood people who simply couldn't physically takes the stuff themselves. And that would be grossly unfair if that kind of person were left out of the permissiveness of the law. So I prefer assisted to die on the whole. So we have a result, and that is that before the debate, in favour of the motion that assisted suicide should be made legal were 408 people in the room. After the debate, it's 406 people. <laughs> well done. <laughs> against were 110, now against, big swing, 208. And the don't knows have moved from 119 to 34, so some people formed a view this evening. It's all been worthwhile.